Well, good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. All right. Glad to see you this morning. If you're standing out in the narthex, I just welcome you in to come have a seat with us today. And I would encourage you, it looks like we have a full house today, so if you happen to be on the ends and there's seats in the middle, if you could scoot in and kind of make room on the ends for families that might be coming in, that would be great. And uh, that way, folks who are coming in can find a seat there and just make some room for folks. That would be excellent. We also have the front rows pretty much open, so I know that seems to be kind of the punishment for those who come in a little later. But... All right, just a few announcements today as we get started. Uh, first, I wanted to mention the car show that's coming up in a couple weeks and just want to thank everybody who signed up uh, for that so far and just ask for your continued prayers for that, that, that more volunteers would come out and help and that it would just be a show where um, the glory is given to God for all the things that go on there and, um, and not to anyone else. And uh, so we ask that uh, you would just be praying for our volunteers, pray for the show in general, that, that God would be glorified in all of that in a couple of weeks here. I also want to mention that Sunday school is starting September 11th, and so put that in your brains and get you starting to think that way. We're looking forward to the Sunday school season starting soon. Otherwise, we have a lot of announcements on the back page, and I'll just kind of let you sift the, through those for yourselves um, as we lead into worship today. I'll let you think about those yourselves this week. Uh, we want to talk about a few things that have happened this week, and one of those is a vacation Bible school. We had vacation Bible school this past week in the park um, at Chandler Park here in town, and that's the first time that we've done that. It was unique, it was fun, and so I just wanted to give you some highlights from that. Our theme was Mystery Island, and so the idea was the kids were on a treasure hunt to learn about the one true God and to find out all about him uh, because he is the treasure that we should all be seeking, right? And so uh, that was our theme, and I was thinking through this, and I thought, you know, 30 kind of seems to be a number of the week. So I have, we had about, on average, 30 children, some days more, some days a few less, at the park, and so that was about the number of children that we had this week at Vacation Bible School. We also had probably about 30-plus hours of time spent in the park this week by volunteers of some sort. So 30 plus hours of time in the park. Also, a little over 30 volunteers who helped out at the park. And uh, I want to just say, hey, anybody who did anything to help VBS go this week, if you would just stand up, uh, teen helpers, adult leaders, uh, volunteers, if you bought food for the snacks, um, donated your trailer so we could bring it out there. Yeah. Thank you. There were so many gifts in so many ways that um, God used so many folks here to put this on this week. It was pretty neat. And then on kind of a silly note, I think that several of our teen volunteers probably ate more than 30 Swedish fish over the week. So... Um, one of the reasons that we did it in the park was outreach. We wanted to reach out to kids that might not otherwise come to church here, and we saw some of that. We did. We had several students attending who don't go to church here, and some who uh, might not even go to church at all. And uh, I think of one day in particular, I think it was Wednesday during the week, uh, the kids were playing on the play set in the park as uh, Pastor Chuck had set up an obstacle course for them, and they're running through it as part of the game station. And these boys came over and joined in. They just couldn't resist. So they came and joined in, and uh, Catherine went, went and talked to their mother, and she said, hey, you know, these, these guys are joining us, and that's fine, but we'd love it if they came the rest of the week and if they wanted to sign up. And so they did. They showed up the next couple of days, and they came out. So it was a beautiful thing. So we saw some of that this past week, and that was um, quite a neat thing. We had uh, all kinds of activities for the kids, crafts, games, lessons, and snacks. And, of course, we had uh, worship times where we were singing uh, Sunday school praise songs together and um, sharing some Bible lessons and things like that. It was a, uh, just a fun week. We're going to sing some of those songs for you during the offering time. We'll have the VBS kids and any helpers come on up, all the helpers. That means you, Sandy and Kathy. I don't know where you are, but anyway. 
Yeah. You can come on up and sing some songs with us. And of course, it's going to involve some participation from everyone here as well. Um, that'll be during the offering. But one of the highlights this week, too, each year we have a mission focus. And we want the kids to learn that um, part of the Christian walk is to give and to give generously. And so we had um, Door of Hope was kind of our mission that we chose. We have missionaries that we support from church here, Jason and Lisa Fillion. And they um, are at Door of Hope in South Africa. And this is a, a, mainly an orphanage ministry, but they also, I mean, they take care of kids at all ages. And uh, we were focused mostly on the baby division of what they're doing because that's where the funds that we raised were going to go. And so Door of Hope has been operating in Johannesburg, South Africa for 22 years now. And they've helped over 1,800 babies, and they've seen 837 adoptions out of that. And so it's been quite a ministry. And uh, some of the things that our money was going towards, we think of um, what they need to take care of these babies. On a monthly basis, Door of Hope goes through 10,000 diapers. They go through 90 tins of formula, 400 liters of milk, 120 boxes of baby cereal, and 900 jars of baby food. So that's what they go through, and that's what our money was going towards is the care of these babies. And so um, those are just some numbers that help you there. And one of the great blessings of the week is that as we told the stories about children who have come to Door of Hope, whether it's through the baby box where a parent who just can't take care of their children anymore can drop them in an um, anonymous way into this box, and it alerts the church there, and they bring this baby in. Um, or whether it's someone who brought their children to Door of Hope and just said, I just can't take care of them. Uh, we told some of these stories to the kids of these children and how they've grown up and even been adopted. And it really connected with the kids and um, the kids shared with their parents. And overall, between um, the kids and teen helpers and leaders who were there who gave, and then also there were some parents who said, we, we want to match certain funds Overall, we were blessed to have seen $1,400 come in for Door of Hope. It was quite amazing. And we want to give you the opportunity to join in that as well. If there's um, if something you'd like to put into the offering for Door of Hope today, uh, you can just mark that um, as part of your gift and put that in the offering plate when we pass it, and we can add that to that gift to Door of Hope. So I just wanted to encourage you with that. That was quite an amazing thing that came from the Vacation Bible School this week as well. We do want to um, remind you, yes, we're going to be singing at the offering time this week, and then next week we plan to show you a little video of the goings-on during the offering time as well. So I'll share with you some of that. As we kind of lead into worship here, and as Pastor Chuck gets ready to come share the call to worship, I just want to share a couple of prayer requests with you. Um, Chuck Dykstra, we want to be praying for Chuck. He's still in the hospital in Columbus, and he's alert, but he doesn't have much of an appetite right now. And uh, so just keep praying for Chuck. And he is available for short visits. Um, they asked, please keep the visit short just to not wear him out. He needs rest and he needs to recover. But if you'd like to visit, you can do that. Um, also, Prayer for the Andrews family. This is a, a segment of the Neef clan. And uh, Ian and Megan Andrews um, are a young couple who was expecting a baby. And shortly before the time to give birth, they found out there was no heartbeat at a checkup. So be praying for them. That's a hard loss. And so be praying for Ian and Megan. And I know we have some other requests as well, but let's just lift these up to the Lord and then Pastor Chuck, if you would come and share the call to worship. Heavenly Father, we just lift up our brother Chuck to you and we ask that you would just sustain him and give him strength, heal him, Lord, um, from these uh, things that are going on in his body. We ask that you just rejuvenate him and encourage him. And Lord, we lift up the Andrews family to you and and the rest of the Neef clan as they mourn together with them. And we ask that you would just um, bless them, encourage them, give them comfort that only you can give, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'd like to ask you to stand, please. Turn in your bulletin. We'll be reading our call to worship from Psalm 18. This is my favorite, I think, maybe, of all the Psalms. Well, maybe next to Psalm 23 and a few others. <laughs> but I can tell that when I, I gave this off to Mary when I was in vacation Bible school and she didn't know what to make of this exactly, it set out almost as if it could be a responsive uh, call to worship, but I'm going to be doing all the reading, and so you can follow along with me if you would. The Psalm of Deliverance, the Psalm of Salvation and Rescue. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of the grave entangled me. Snares, the snares of death confronted me. And in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help from his temple. He heard my voice, and my cry reached his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke rose up from his nostrils, the devouring fire from his mouth, glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on the cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made the darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Thick darkness, thick clouds, dark with water. And out of the brightness before him, Hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord thundered in the heavens. The Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath from your nostrils. He sent from one high, and he took hold of me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. What a great God we serve. Father in heaven, we thank you for being this rescuing, saving God. This dramatic, vivid, and savingly real description of your coming down, as it were, to save this one who was in such dire straits, reminds us so distinctly of you sending your own son through the heavens and down to us, but not in that kind of mighty way, but in humility and to die on the cross, to give his life as a ransom for us. Our enemy was too great for us, and you rescued us. Father in heaven, with the reminder of your saving work today, we ask that you would help us to turn our thoughts to you, to put our refuge, to take refuge in you, to remember your deliverances, and to worship you for all that you are and all that you've done and all that you will do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we just heard about the the power of God, and we're going to be singing about the power of God here. When I think of power, I'm an electrician, so I think of power, and at work we call it little power and big power. We've got different voltages, 
depending on what voltage we work on. With God, it's awesome power. Um, and there's a couple other parallels. With power, it's limited. Electricity is limited. It, it, the further it goes down the wire, the weaker it gets, right? God is unlimited. Unlimited, unmatched power. And the other thing with power is electricity anyways. If you put the wrong power to the wrong thing, it's going to blow up, right? <laughs> so we make mistakes. I've blown a lot of stuff up. God doesn't make mistakes with his power, right? He's got a perfect plan, and he always knows what he's doing. And even with that huge, immense power that he's got, he's still got his eye on the sparrow, as we're going to sing. So he's got his eye on you and me and the sparrow as well. So a few things about power as we sing about the power of God. Let's join together in worship. Awesome power, boundless grace, none can fathom all your ways. Truth and love are found in your heart alone, righteousness surrounds your There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you.
mountains join him too. Dead are raised to life. Finish the victory cry. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Took the blame for the wrath we stand for giving at the cross. Oh, to see the name. This is a verse that everybody learned in VBS this last week, so I thought it was fitting to read it here during worship. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones.
Would you join your hearts in prayer with me this morning? Lord Jesus, we do pray that you would help us to put our trust in you. Help us to recognize your awesome power, Lord. Your power that you show us daily, moment by moment. The power of the cross, Lord, of your blood shed for each and every one of us. To cover up our sin, to cover up our ugliness, Lord. Lord Jesus, we'd like to take some time and come before you this morning to silently confess our sins to you. Lord, we thank you that your power and your grace do not have a limit. They don't run out. They don't grow weaker. Lord, there is a full and overwhelming storehouse of it for us to forgive us again and again and again as we fail you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for hearing our prayers, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear this affirmation of God's grace to you. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the Lord again in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can come before you this morning. We thank you that we can gather together as a body, as a family of believers, Lord Jesus, and worship you. And Lord, we know there are members of our family here that are not among us. So Lord, we lift them up to you. And we pray that you would comfort them. We pray that you would heal them. We pray that you would reach down and wrap your loving arms around them, that they would feel your presence with them this very moment, Lord. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, Lord Jesus, and are grieving deeply. Lord, we pray that you would come alongside, that you would encourage. Lord, we just pray that they would be able to see your hand in the tragedies and in the struggles of their lives. Lord, we know that you are in control, even though we sometimes struggle to see why you do things. You have a perfect plan, and help us to trust you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the ministry of VBS in the past week, Lord Jesus. We just pray that the seeds that have been planted will grow and flourish. We, Lord, we pray that these youth will come to know you, Lord Jesus, even if they didn't in the past week, that as they live their lives, Lord Jesus, they would see their desperate need for you in them. Lord, we pray for our youth as they're going back to school, Lord we pray that you would go with them, go ahead of them, Lord Jesus, that you would surround them with godly friends, teachers that can be an encouragement to them and that can prop them up, Lord, in this world that has so many pulls on us in so many different directions, Lord, help us, help them to stay on the straight and narrow path, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray for the other ministries that are going on in this church. We think of Sky Lodge has its kind of drawing to a close this summer. We just thank you for the outreach that has happened there. We pray, Lord, that you would allow the staff to be able to recharge and refresh themselves, Lord, as the weeks start to slow down. Lord, we pray for Quest and Club 68, Lord, and the leaders there, Lord. We pray that you give them wisdom as they deal with so many different uh, backgrounds that the children come from and questions that they're bringing and just the life situations that they're in, Lord. Give them wisdom. Help us to look to your word for the answers, Lord. Lord, we just pray that as the rest of the service goes on, Lord, that it would be pleasing to you. We pray for Pastor Chuck as he brings us the message that you would speak through him to us, Lord. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. to invite the ushers forward this morning. Lord Jesus, you do have uh, your eye on us, Lord, and you do provide for us. And we just thank you for the gifts that you have blessed us with. Lord, we pray that you take these tithes and these offerings and that you'd use them to further your kingdom, Lord Jesus. We ask this all in your name. Amen.
platform, guys, and let's, we're going to sing a couple of songs. Come on, Judah. All right, there we go. The first song we're going to sing is Great and Mighty is the Lord Our God. And so uh, the kids are going to sing this song for you, and there's some fun actions that go along with it. And uh, in fact, I might just have you, well, no, we're taking the offering, you can't stand up, but if you have already done it, you could do the actions even in your seat. So here we go. I see the plates are just about through. And so this next one is a favorite each year at Bible school. And we're going to do it here. You've probably done this one yourself in Sunday school. Um, but we are going to basically split the room in half right down the middle. So we're going to have one half and then the other. And we're going to sing kind of in rounds. And so the first side will be this side over here, the spiritual side. And <laughs> we're going to sing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And as we stand up, and then we'll sit down, and this side will stand up, and they will sing, praise ye the Lord, okay? And then they'll sit down, and then this side will rise, hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. You get it? All right, so kids, you don't get a chance to sit up there, but we'll split you down the middle, and you can just kind of crouch, all right, and then stand up when it's your turn. All right. Praise God, indeed. We had a wonderful week at Vacation Bible School. Do we have one more song we'd like to sing, or is that going to be it? God is so big, so strong and so mighty. Okay, one last song. God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Thank you, everyone. You can come on back down. Great job. Well, I want to just uh, welcome, we're going to have our uh, young people who have been through the communicants class and who are professing their faith this week. We want to ask you to come up, and I'll just read your names off. They're in the bulletin. Bodie Johansson, Brianna Fisher, Catherine Went, Christina Considine, and Mason Muscanera. If you guys would just come up here. 
invite you guys to all come up. One, two, three, four, five. We got them all. You guys can just spread that over here and over here. It's fine. Yeah. Just come in close, though, whatever you do. About 15 years ago or so, uh, this world welcomed these little babies into the world. And uh, families that received them, of course, were quite happy. And the churches that received them as well were quite happy. And uh, now uh, the culmination of many prayers, many uh, you know, longings of parents and of church members that these young people would come and profess their faith before Jesus Christ and before this congregation. Uh, that day has come. It's a great, great day to recognize. And so we have these five kids who are coming forward and two of them which will be, Christine, which will be uh, Mason Muscanero and Catherine Went will also be baptized. But just want to mention what these kids have done. They are coming up to profess their personal faith in Christ and to join this church. They have been through a process leading up to this in which they've attended a 17 week membership class that basically goes through the gospel and the doctrines of the church and the responsibilities of church membership, all of that culminated in an interview with a couple of the elders from this church in which they have heard and listened to the actual personal profession of faith coming from these young people. The elders have deemed that their professions of faith are credible and we're thankful for that, of course, and so today they are standing here to become Members, It's no insignificant thing to profess your faith in front of God's people. In fact, it is a great culmination. We are so thankful for young people who are growing up and professing their faith, standing in front of the Church of Christ and saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. I need him. I dedicate my life to him and to his service and to the service of his church. Wow, what a blessing. It's no insignificant thing to belong to the church of Jesus Christ. And I just want to comment on this as well and say that every person who is a believer in Jesus Christ should do what these young people are doing, professing their faith publicly before Christ's church and then becoming a member of that body in which they are presently worshiping. And so this is a good example to all of us, and I want to commend that to many of you, if you are not a member of Christ's church, and specifically of this church, if you are a regular attender here, we want to encourage you to take the bold step and declare your faith and declare your sense of belonging here in our midst. So with that admonition, it's the intent here um, for these five who are with us to profess their faith, and we're going to use that with the solemn uh, uh, membership vows and so I'm going to ask these questions of all five of you guys and even though one of you might be able to answer I want all five of you to answer together okay and since the questions begin with the word do you do you do you that's the way each of the questions then your response is properly I do okay although we're not getting married this morning okay <laughs> do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God justly deserving his displeasure and without hope except for God's sovereign mercy. Do you? And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for your salvation as he is offered to you in the gospel? Do you? And do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? And do you promise to support the church and its worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? And do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to work for its purity and peace, do you? Well, having heard that then, as a minister of the gospel, I want to uh, acknowledge that as a clear profession of faith, and then I want to ask for 
Mason and Catherine, if you guys would come up here, and it would be appropriate just to kneel here and face the congregation, and you'll be um, baptized next here. We come to the sacrament of baptism, and ba baptism is a sacrament. It's a holy ordinance given by God in which uh, we are acknowledging and setting aside these two young people for um, God's holy purposes. They are recipients of God's promises, and this waters of baptism recognize their belonging in the church and God's making his promises to them, promises that have been fulfilled in one measure today in their making of the profession of personal faith, and then Acknowledging also that the, God, the promises of God uh, began a long time before these children were even born. And they continue here today. And they will continue into thousands and millions of years from now as God remains faithful to the promises that he has made to them. And so we mark them today with the mark of baptism, the mark of God's calling them to himself. Catherine went as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ then I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mason Muscanero I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to uh, just pray and welcome, we'll welcome these kids into membership of the church. Father in heaven, we thank you for blessing your church with more and more young people, children, generations. We thank you for those who have stood up here on the, on the stage this morning and sung. We thank you, Lord, for those who are yet to be born. We thank you, Lord, for those uh, of us who have grown up and have gray hair and, and illnesses and difficulties and struggling even to hang on to life. We thank you for your faithful promises to all those who belong to you. We ask in particular for these five that we are bringing into membership in your church today. Lord, we ask that you would continue to strengthen their faith, and as they grow, that their faith would increase according to the challenges that they face and according to the needs that they have. And Lord, we pray that that faith would be strengthened and grow year after year, decade after decade, and that your spirit would persevere with them and through them and that you would see them through to the very end of this life and into glory and that we would all reach that place together where your church is gathered in holiness and in, 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 in glory and in um, complete and final and forever satisfaction. So Lord, we ask that you would keep these safe and lead them along, preserve them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome. Grace Church. Welcome. 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 You guys can have a seat. Thank you. In any church, there are quite a few joys, and there are quite a few needs. There are an unlimited number of prayer requests and, and uh, an unlimited number, if they were only remembered at one time, of joys that we have and that we share together. A kind of a combination and crossover of all those is um, something that Steve Schultz would like to come up now and just share with us. He's got a word to share with us. Is Steve still in the house? There he is. Come on up, Steve. Yeah, sure, we're going to need this mic. Maybe we're on already. Well, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for praying for my granddaughter even before she was born. And I thought it would be fitting to bring her up in front of the congregation, seeing as how they traveled all the way up from Louisiana here this week and present Eliana to you. Um, she's still, you know, is in need of your prayers because she has uh, cerebral palsy and, and uh, uh, numerous other things going on with her. I, I'm not certain what all they are, but uh, 
Um, I'd just like to thank you all for uh, praying for her all, all this time now and, and, uh, and let her mother short. <laughs> I also received a text this morning from Gail Neef, and I want to, what are we doing with the microphones here? Okay, this mic is off and I'm not gonna use this mic anymore, okay. Um, a couple of other prayer requests that were mentioned by Gail Neef, um, for one thing, um, Cal Barden's wife, Joyce, lost her mother, who died yesterday. I wanna encourage you to reach out to and pray for Joyce. And also on their list is that uh, Stephanie Neef, Micah and Stephanie, Stephanie Neef's father died last Saturday. Some of you might have already heard that through the grapevine. That is another prayer need that we have within our congregation. Cheryl Neef is improving. We put her through the prayer chain last week about this time because she was having difficulties and she's recovering but still feeling exhausted. Seems like there's something else. There are always more and I can't keep them all in my head at a time and I Unfortunately, I don't have any more of those to uh, anything else written, so I'm going to end right there. Could I ask for you to open your Bibles next? We're going to read God's Word from um, 1 Timothy chapter 6 today. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Timothy chapter 6, and if you look down in the middle of verse 2, there's a heading, at least in my Bible, that says uh, false teachers and true contentment, and that is the paragraph that we are reading together today. Teach and urge these things, Paul says. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up and conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and a constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take out take anything out of the world, but we, if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Content. It's a striking verse. I'm not going to preach on that verse later, but it struck me numerous times as a verse that really speaks to all of us as relatively rich Americans. If we have food and clothing, we will be content. It comes from a different world. And it's instructing us to live in a different way, isn't it? But those who desire to be rich, verse 9, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many self senseless and harmful desires and that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This is God's word. Father in heaven, we thank you for being our God. Oh, how blessed we are.
to have you as our God and to have you as the one who has made us and understands us instructing us today. We ask that you would, by your spirit, through the voice of your word and through the weak voice of this preacher, Lord, we ask that you would, in fact, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Certainly one of the main themes of 1 Timothy, certainly one of the main themes of 1 Timothy um, is Paul, uh, Paul's reoccurring charge to Timothy in which he is telling him to correct the false teaching and to remove the false teachers from the church that are leading people astray. And because of this, according to this letter, because of these false teachers, certain persons have swerved away from setting their hope on the living God. They are putting their hope in other things besides God himself. Because of these certain persons who are leading people astray, many have wandered from centering their hope on Jesus Christ, who God sent into the world to save sinners. Their attention has wandered away from their faith in Christ, and they have become infatuated with myths and with speculations, with half-truths and full-out lies, and as a result, many have shipwrecked their lives, having abandoned a sincere faith, and having abandoned a good conscience, and having abandoned a pure heart. And so we might picture this church that is besieged in Ephesus with this false teaching as being something like maybe a beautifully sculpted sandcastle that's built on the beach maybe over many hours with many ornate figures all around and a great moat and a wall and all the spires and towers. And yet as the tide begins to wash in, it begins to... It begins to dash against this castle and to erode the castle with the rising of the tide. And the church that Timothy is pastoring here is a church that, like that castle, has been eroded and dashed by these false teachings and false teachers. And what's at stake then in this church really is the soul of the church itself, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only the soul of the church, but the soul of every person in that church is under attack and in danger of losing their individual and personal delight and centering on Jesus Christ. And so the primary charge of 1 Timothy is for Timothy to wage a good warfare against the devil and against the devil's lies and against the devil's liars who are in fact embedded in that church and not only to wage a warfare against them but then to teach the truth to the people of God, to teach them the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and to call the people back to a true Christ-centeredness again to call them back to living in a manner that leads to godliness and godly blessings. And it's this reoccurring main charge of 1 Timothy that has, quite honestly, made the biggest impact in me over these last 17 weeks that we've been looking at this short letter. For me, the big picture here has been the thing that's been becoming more and more clear with every passing week in this, in this book has been this. And that is that God is good. And that God is holy. And that God is righteous. And God is pure. And that God, when he created everything, he created everything as a reflection of himself. Perfect, good, holy, and true. And when God made the whole universe, he set it in place according to wisdom, according to truth. And therefore, all truth that is truly true, all truth that is truly true is God's truth. He's the author of truth. He is the father of truth. He is the creator of truth. All truth 
emanates from him. And so every principle in the universe is true because God is true. Every principle that is truly true and it remains true, it remains true because God is true. Every promise that God has made Every promise that God has made, it will remain trustworthy and true. Why? Because God who makes these promises is perfectly true. And every precept of moral law that God has made in the Old Testament, in the New, everything that God has stated is in fact true, infallibly and unvariably true and good. In fact, everything good in the universe is good because God is good and everything in the universe that God has made is emanating the identity of its creator to the extent that it shows off beauty and shows off good and shows off true truths. Conversely, we have also seen here in this book then that Satan is the author of lies and that Satan is, in fact, the author of lies. Satan is the originator of every lie that ever was and ever will be. As a reflection of his nature, of Satan's nature, everything that emanates from Satan is, in fact, corrupt. Everything that emanates from Satan is deceitful. Everything that he promises, he won't completely deliver. Everything that he even promises to his own demons, it must be false. Why? Because Satan himself is false. He's the liar. And therefore, every knockoff of Christianity, every look-alike, but not the real thing, church, is his. It's Satan's work. Every false teaching and every false teacher is his. He's doing Satan's work. It's Satan's lies that are being propagated. Every temptation that you have ever faced and that you ever will face, it's Satan's temptation. It's a lie from him. He's the one that's behind it all. In fact, every skeptical suggestion that I should doubt the truth of God is also the work of Satan. And every skeptical inference that I might be right to doubt the existence of God or to doubt the true goodness of God or to doubt the true mercy and grace of God, every inference against the truth is planted by Satan. It comes from the father of lies. It comes from the evil one. The promise of pornography with sex without borders The promise of happiness there is Satan's promise. It's his promise. The promise of materialism making you happy. It's his promise. It's his promise. The promise that hope and happiness and ultimate happiness could be supplied by anything except God. It's his. It's his promise. Satan is the one behind it, not God. Why is this true? It's true because Satan is the big liar. He's the author of lies. He's the father of lies. He's the originator of all the lies that are. And so here's the great application that's really been speaking to me in this last couple of months together here. It's that just as the church needs is called to be the pillar and buttress of truth in this world, and therefore we need in the church to root out, to to root out all falsehood and all false teachers, just as that's true in the church, so it's true in me. And so it's true in you. But I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. This is the message that's really come home more clearly than ever to me. In my own life, I need to recognize every lie because it's a lie. And I need to recognize every idol that turns my head away from God and would at times seem like, you know, that's where my happiness is going to come from. I need to recognize every idol. I need to recognize every scam that Satan uses on me and not just recognizing it, but recognizing it for what it is. It's a torpedo to my soul. It's the intention of Satan from deep down in some abyss to send something to my soul to destroy my love for God, and my satisfaction in him. And then I not only need to identify that, but with God's help, I need to root that out of my life completely. That's the thing that's been impressing me so much. 
I got a phone call this week. Maybe you got the same phone call. It was a call from my credit card company. It was a recorded message that said that there had been some suspicious activity on my credit card account. There was a particular amount that they mentioned to me in the recorded message. There was a particular amount that was charged to my card, and there was a certain place where that purchase was made, and they were warning me in this pre-recorded message that if I hadn't made that purchase, that I could stay on the line and push a certain button on my phone, and that they would connect me with my customer service agent, and that they would then assist me to save me from having to pay this charge that might not have been made by me. Of course, it was a scam. As everyone should know, that's a scam. They want me to push that button. They want me to verify my ID. They want to know the last three digits or whatever, or my whole credit card number. They want to verify that me. And so they would then, posing to help me, actually defraud me. They would steal from me, even though they promise that they are taking care of my needs. I don't fall for that. I don't fall for that. I knew almost immediately when that phone call came on. Fake, fake, lie, lie, scam, scam. But what's become more clear to me than ever before is that every temptation of Satan is intended for my destruction. It's a torpedo to my soul. There is actually no good scam of the devil. There is actually not one good lie. There is actually not one good promise. There is actually not one idol of the heart that I really need that will be better than what I have in God. He wants me to think that I'll need something else besides God. And it's always a lie. It's always a torpedo to my soul. And with that becoming more freshly uh, clear in my mind, I find myself even waking up in the morning often. And my first thoughts as I'm bringing my thoughts before God is something like this. Lord, I don't want to have any single tiny lie in my life. I don't want to have any idol in my life that would take me away from you. I don't want to mistakenly be trusting in some lie of Satan which will really leave me hopeless and leave me helpless. Oh, Lord, I only want you. I only want to know the truth. I only want to believe the truth. I only want to give my life and lay my life down for you. And Lord, help me root out then everything in my life that is not from you. You are good. He is evil. I want to follow you. Now, the proposition of our text today, building upon this, would be that the pursuit of God and Christ and godliness, the pursuit of God thoroughly and ultimately will satisfy you because it is God who ultimately can satisfy you. Whereas... The pursuit of anything else in the place of God, the pursuit of any other law, any other thing besides God, it cannot ultimately satisfy because only God can satisfy. That's the proposition of this message today. And so if you'll look with me, we're going to trace that down through these nine verses. Open up your Bible if you've closed your Bible. And let's look at these nine verses here that are under this banner, this heading, false teachers and true contentment. And so we're in the middle of verse 2, and we begin reading here, and the first thing that Paul states under that chapter heading or that paragraph heading is this, teach and urge these things. Teach and urge these things. What things? It's very clear Paul is saying this. I think it's the fourth time, teach and urge these things, teach these things, teach these things teach these things. It's very clear from this context that what Paul is speaking of is he's saying, teach and urge true doctrine. That's found in verse 2, which would be the doctrine of God, the doctrine of the whole counsel of God. Teach and urge the sound words of Jesus Christ, which would be at least the gospel of Jesus Christ. Teach and urge the gospel on people, Jesus on people. 
and teach and urge those teachings which accord with godliness, so the, the moral teaching that we've previously seen in this book about setting an example for others in speech and in conduct, in love, in faith and in purity. And so teach that which leads to godly living. Well, the next thing following that charge in verse 3, Paul reminds Timothy that there are those, even in the church, who are departing from true doctrine of God, who are departing from the sound words of Jesus Christ and the gospel, who are departing from the moral law according to godliness. And the results, the results of exchanging the revealed truths of God for a lie are actually borne out then in verses 4 through 10. So look down with me in verses 4 through 10, and I want to summarize the results of turning away from the truth using 10 words that describe what we find here in these four verses, in these, in these nine verses here. The first word to describe those who have wandered away from the faith here, who have given up the true knowledge of God, who have been teaching falsehood or believing falsehood, the first word would be the word arrogance. And I'm taking that from verse 4, where they are described, these ones who have left the truth, they're described as puffed up with conceit. In other words, they think that they're in the know. They think that they are the enlightened ones now, that they know more than those who just know mere Christianity. Paul couples that uh, puffed up with conceit, I'm calling that arrogance, with a second word, ignorance, also in verse 4. Puffed up with conceit, they understand nothing. And that's exactly what the arrogating pride in the face of God actually is. When I'm thinking, I know something, I know better than God, that's pride and stupidity. It's arrogance and it's emptiness all in one. Romans 1 describes that same reality, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the high and glorious knowledge of the immortal God. They exchanged the knowledge of the immortal God for things that they could find upon the earth. A third word that we could find that we could use here to describe these false teachers or those who believed their lies is the word restless. And I'm taking that from verses four and five, which might well draw together the general sense of verses four and five. We find their words like this. They're typified by quarreling, envy, dissension, slander, suspicions, constant friction. There's a few more words in there, but those all are depicting a kind of a restlessness of soul. I want more. I need more. I'm not happy inwardly. There's a restlessness there. The fourth word that could be used to describe these, the lot of these people is deluded. I'm taking that from verse 5, where it simply says that they are imagining, verse 5, quote, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. And, and a means of gain here, specifically, in the context, it means they think that godliness is a means of getting rich. In other words, godliness isn't a good thing in itself, but godliness will enable me to get what I really want, which is money. And so they're deluded in that way. The next description would be the word greedy. Verse 9 they desire to be rich. Verse 10, they're motivated by the love of money. And by the way, Jesus at this point, he says, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot both love God and love money. You can't serve God and serve money. Either you will love the one master and hate the other, or you will hate the one and you will love the, man, the other, but you cannot love God and money. Here are people who are running after money. What does that tell me? The greed. It's the greed. It's greed. We're halfway through this picture. That's the first five words. The sixth word is the word falling, and I'm taking that from verse 9, if you're looking there. Desiring to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare, and into many senseless and harmful desires. And we should just stop on this. This is a very unique thing. Um, particularly for Americans. It's apparently not completely unique because Paul is giving it here 
What he's describing is that by the desire to get rich, that people have plunged themselves into senseless and harmful desires. They're opening themselves up to temptations. There's a very powerful delusion here that turns many, many people away, actually from God himself. The lie of Satan that money and the things that money can buy and the security that would appear to come from money, the lie of money is a greatly deluding thing. Many people fall here. In fact, on account of this stumbling or falling over money, the seventh and eighth words found in verse 10, they're found in verse 10, which states, through this craving, and it's again, it's the craving for money, through this craving, some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And so wandering from the faith, that would be the seventh word, wandering, and the eighth word would be they've pierced themselves with many pangs or pains. This is just one of the ways that sin works its way out when you're living for an idol or living for a sin, and inevitably, in the way that God has ordered the universe, there will be pains that will be associated with that along the way. There will be difficulties. There will be pangs. There will be stumblings. There will be problems. And it's actually often a part of God's kind grace that he does attend our sins and our idolatries with pains because it's those pains that would make us realize, what's wrong with this? What am I doing wrong? And to turn us away from that which is causing us unnecessary pain. The ninth word is the word plunged. It's found in verse 9. I take that from verse 9 where it says that the natural consequence of Satan's lies and cravings of anything as being greater than God is that a man or a woman finds himself or herself, verse 9, plunged into ruin and destruction. And this is certainly speaking, might be speaking of other things as well, but it's certainly speaking of everlasting destruction in hell. So isn't it an amazing thing how this begins with just arrogant and ignorant and restless, deluded, greedy, stumbling or falling, wandering, piercing, and then even plunged into destruction. The tenth word that I'm using here is the word insatiable. Insatiable. I picked that word and I thought, does that really mean what I say, what I'm thinking? I looked up the definition of it. The definition of insatiable is incapable of being satisfied. That's what these people are. They have put themselves in a row that makes them incapable of being satisfied. And we see that in these kinds of phrases and words. They have an unhealthy craving, verse 4. The, the envy that they have reveals that they're not happy. They want what other people have. They want more. Enough is not enough. What they have is not enough. They want what others have, envy. And then constant friction typifies so many who can never relax, never be happy, never rest content. And then the, the phrase in verse 9, um, the, the senseless and harmful desires. They're senseless and harmful desires. That's often characteristic even of the addict who craves and desires even the very thing that is ruining him. And so the word insatiable, meaning incapable of being satisfied, is apt because as Augustine has famously stated in his confessions, he says, O oh Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Isn't that an amazing statement? That's the answer. Oh, Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. Isn't that alone enough to convince you, even this very moment, that yielding to Satan's lies, that dabbling with Satan's temptations, or even 
receiving the idols of your life and, and longing for things that might otherwise even be good, that living for those things, those attractive distractions, is indeed a torpedo to your soul and to your ever-finding contentment in God. They will not satisfy. They will not satisfy. In closing, in verses 6 through 8, we have described a better way. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Memorize that. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Think about that for a moment. Godliness is Paul's shorthand description of the true Christian's simple, singular pursuit of God. Godwardness, godliness. I want God. I want to honor him. Godliness with contentment, with contentment. Contentment, again, it means satisfaction. It's the opposite of insatiable. It's satisfied. I'm satisfied. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain, the great gain of a blood-bought child of God is that you belong to God that you belong entirely to God and that God loves you and he cares for you and he takes care of you every day of your life into all of eternity. And you can trust him. You can walk with him. You know, there's no passage in scripture that I know of that more simply and clearly and shortly summarizes what great gain is than the 23rd Psalm, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's great gain. I have a God, I have a shepherd who takes care of me, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's great gain. That's great gain. And so godliness, Godward living in Christ with contentment, real satisfaction, real security, godliness with contentment is great gain. Father in heaven, here we are before you, and many of us are not satisfied. We're discontent. We're mad. We feel overlooked, all alone, empty, overloaded, unsatisfied. Oh, Lord, you've made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless. Our hearts are mad, unsatisfied, empty. Would you help us to find our rest in you? What am I hoping for? What am I trusting in? What are we pining for, Lord? Lord. What are we wishing we had more than you? Who are you, Lord? What have you done for me? You made me. You named me. You wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundations of the world. You saw me before I was even born. Before I even existed, you saw my need. You sent your son to save me. He came and he died in my place to pay for my penalty so that I could be reconciled and made righteous in your sight and reconciled to my heavenly father and be given all of the promises, every promise, every good and true promise every promise that satisfies. You've given to me a new life. You've given to me new inclinations. You've given to me a new standing. You've loved me. You've adopted me into your house. You've cared for me. You've led me every day. There's never been a day that I haven't had food and clothing and a covering over my head. I lack no good thing. 
You promise never to leave me or forsake me. Lord, I ask that you would turn our eyes again to you and that where we have gone wrong, that you would show us. Where we're believing lies, Lord, help us to see and stop believing. What I'm loving more than you, what we're wanting or craving more than you, show it to us, Lord. Lord, what is it that you want us to see? What is it that you want us to know? What is it that you want us to remember? What is it that you want us to trust you for? Search us, O God, and know our hearts. See if there is any wicked way in us. Show us, Lord, and lead us in your way everlasting to satisfaction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me for our closing hymn, In Christ Alone My Hope is Found. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my soul this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths I give the benediction. I'd like to just remind you we do have a hamburger.
cookout after church today. We have quite a few guests. I'm sure we'll have enough hamburgers and hot dogs. And if you'd like to save yourself the work of going somewhere else to eat or going home to eat, we want to welcome you all to stay. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.